Okay, guys, welcome back. So in this lecture, we'll get into cardiac surgery. So the first thing we'll touch on are different surgery types and um, some of the precautions later on. But uh, probably the most common approach that we'll see is the median sternotomy. Um, we'll get into why in a bit. Um, we'll see this utilized for coronary artery bypass graft or cabbage, uh, valve replacements or repairs, um, you know, heart transplants as well. Uh, this is uh, the approach that most easily allows a surgeon to, to visualize all the structures. Um, it's, it's probably the gold standard approach for, for most cardiac surgeries. Um, we're seeing more and more of these as well, these mixed procedures or minimally invasive cardiac surgeries. We'll get into what those are um, and when they're indicated. And then uh, these are other different approaches. We'll get more into these when we start getting into thoracic surgery in our pulmonary unit, but uh, thoracotomies, which we will use for uh, lobectomy, so that's cutting into like a half of the chest wall um, to expose maybe a, a lung lobe to be removed. Uh, there is also bilateral thoracotomies where we'll do both sides of the chest wall when we kind of, uh, you know, almost form a clamshell-like structure um, with the ribs because uh, we're cutting both sides open and that's used for uh, a lung transplant, especially a, a bilateral lung transplant um, where we're going to be, you know, need to visualize both structures and be able to move them out. Um, we're seeing more and more of these too, these video-assisted thoracic surgeries, uh, lobectomies, um, which again, it's very similar to the mixed procedure that we use a robot uh, to kind of help assist us with the procedure and we minimize the, uh, the size of the surgical scar. So again, that first approach we talked about, the median sternotomy, uh, what it involves is exactly how, as it sounds if we break down the Latin root. So median right down the middle and then sternotomy, right? We're going to open up the sternum. So uh, it's exactly that. It's a vertical incision um, along the sternum. Um, and then we open up and retract uh, the, the sternum to expose the mediastinal structures. So the heart is really easily visualized here. Um, that's why it's a preferred approach for, for cardiac surgery, um, because we can, you know, you know, easily see the, the structures we're operating on, uh, to you know, perform our surgeries. So, uh, there are now these less invasive options. Again, we talked about the mixed procedures where instead of opening up the chest wall, uh, we just insert four little, or really five ports, um, where we have different catheters placed in to visualize or to operate in the heart. So instead of having to cut open the whole chest and you know crack it open and keep it retracted, um, which can cause obviously a lot of pain, there's going to be a, a pretty large scar over the chest with this median sternotomy again, because we're cutting through the skin, all the tissue on top of it, and then retracting open the, the bone. There's going to be a pretty sizable and noticeable scar with this. There's a lot less of an aesthetic impact, right? So um, there's less of that of that you know scar. Um, so for patients, that's something to consider. Now, the uh, the pros again, there's you know better cosmetics, typically a shorter hospital stay because you don't you know may not have some of the same pulmonary issues that are, that arise after you know immediate sternotomy. Uh, the, the downside is, though, you typically are on the cardiopulmonary bypass machine a little bit longer, which if you're an older patient or someone maybe at a high risk for having some of the issues that arise with being on a bypass, it might not be a, they may not be a good candidate. And anytime someone has an emergent cardiac surgery, they're going to use a cabbage just because it's an easier setup. Um, and again, that's, that's the gold standard, which most surgeons were trained on. Um, this is a video here showing you that a cabbage procedure and kind of what it looks like, similar to the stenting procedure. You can do this on your own time. And again, it's not super critical that you, you know, know the intricacies of what they're doing with each, you know, the whole procedure, but it's kind of cool to look at. I recommend if you are on an acute care uh, affiliation or clinical, like to get some, you know, get some observation hours in a surgery room and in an OR, um, just to see kind of what, it, what like the body goes through uh, during these procedures, which may give you a better understanding of some of the limitations uh, that these patients may have. And we'll get into some of those at the end of this series of lectures um, uh, following these procedures. So just something to, uh, for you guys to review there. Now, um, again, we'll talk about the cabbage procedure. Again, we talked about the, you know, the, the approaches that we'll often utilize. Most often it's that median sternotomy. Um, and you know, when we're talking about treating coronary artery disease, uh, the cabbage procedure, the coronary artery bypass graft, probably uh, it's probably the most it was, it's our surgical approach for, for treating um, heart disease. Now, it was first performed in 1967, and 
you know, initially then we were doing like single bypasses. So you would bypass a blockage and we'll show you what that looks like. Um, but we would, you know, we would identify a blockage in a vessel and then we would perform a bypass by using a grafted vessel, often from the saphenous vein. Um, so we'd harvest that, take out that extra, you know, that vein, um, you know, process it basically, um, and then, you know, retool it as a bypass for the coronary artery system. I'll show you what that looks like um, in a later slide. So we started out just doing single bypasses. So we'd only bypass one blockage. Now there are, you know, you know, most people are getting triple, quadruple, even quintuple bypasses. So five arteries bypassed. Um, and we're getting, you know, it's getting a lot safer too. So the mortality rate is pretty low. There is some risk of people having an MI during the procedure. We would call that a type two MI. Um, but uh, that is possible, um, you know, especially if it's an emergent case. Uh, but often we try to do these in a non-emergent fashion. So we identify a plaque, you know, maybe in the patient who, you know, has multiple blockages, you know, identified on a coronary angiogram that we showed you guys before. If they got usually two or more blockages, they'll probably do a bypass just because it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, or if we see, you know, a very high blockage. So if like maybe someone's got a blockage in the left main coronary artery, which again branches into the LAD and LCX, if that's blocked, they'll, they'll do a bypass just because that's a really severe, really high up block. But cardiologists are getting more and more um, bold, um, you know, and the technology is getting better. But that's typically when these are indicated. And again, this is just an example of kind of what we do, what the procedure looks like. So they do the saphenous vein harvest, which we have here, right? So they'll cut out the saphenous vein, they'll convert it, they'll you know, strip it down and convert it to uh, you know, be fit for the, for the, for the bypass. We'll identify that blockage. We'll suture, you know, one end from the aorta, and just go right past where that blockage is. So there's still perfusion, you know, upstream, but you know, prior, you know, to this bypass, everything downstream was blocked because there was this, you know, you know, plaque or a really, you know, gnarly, you know, or a, um, you know, a, uh, a clot. Uh, so if we just bypass it, you know connecting it from the aorta to beyond where that blockage is, we will be able to feed all those tributaries. So uh, that's really, again, the purpose of the cabbage procedure, you know, in a blockage that's really higher up, or if we have multiple different uh, areas that are blocked, instead of doing like seven stents or something like that, or six stents, you know, we'll do just, you know, we'll do, we'll just go past where those, those blockages are. Now, in some instances, um, you know, we're, we're learning that yeah, some patients um, who receive a bypass using a saphenous vein harvest, uh, the, the valve, or sorry, the, the vessel, the, the harvested vessel closes um, after you know, about 10 or so years, um, you know, and this kind of created a conundrum that, all right, well, we bypassed the blockage using the saphenous vein, you know, and but if we look at some of the long-term outcomes, you know, these veins were having issues too. And then if you think about it, veins don't have the same endothelium really as we see in an artery. So that, you know, the autoregulatory capacity that, you know, is really important for maintaining perfusion uh, at higher demands. So what's gaining more and more popularity is a, we call it a lima graft or a left internal mammary artery. Uh, this is uh, located off, you know, off the subclavian, um, and it's just from, it's, and it's separated from the chest wall. So it's, it feeds the rib cage, um, but you know, we can, are able to uh, separate its distal end to be used as a, as a bypass um, or uh, use, it, use, use in bypass. So um, we're seeing more and more again, just because again, it's, it's a, you know, your arteries are a little bit thicker. They're designed for the high pressure that's gonna happen, right? You know, you know at the aorta, right? So we wanna have arteries have a little bit, you know, a little bit more muscle to maintain those pressures or tolerate those pressures. And they have that endothelial function. So they stay open a, a lot longer, um, you know, you know, compared to vein grass again, 66%, you know, it would only be open. So 33% close in, in 33, 33 cases. Um, the disadvantage is it's a longer procedure um, because we've got to do, again, you know, this careful dissection from the chest wall. Uh, there's a limited length. The saphenous vein is pretty easy to access. It's pretty long, um, 
and the left internal mammary artery feeds the sternum. So one of the big problems with a cabbage procedure is trying to get the, the chest to close back up and heal. And if you know the perfusion's impaired, it may cause a malunion to the chest wall and can, can lead to some serious um, you know, cosmetic and, and painful situations for the patients after surgery. Uh, and it's almost never, it's never used for an emergent cabbage procedure just because it's, you know, it's a, it's a longer procedure. They're going to use a saphenous vein, easy access, and, you know, and use that median sternotomy. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about, again, the, uh, the you know, cabbage. So uh, cabbage surgery takes about four hours to complete. Uh, you know, so the whole procedure of going through the you know, patient's anesthetized, we're, you know, extracting arteries. And the patient's only, you know, clamped, right? So they're, you know, when we, when we clamp the aorta, uh, you know, they're hooked up to this bypass machine, which oxygenates and, perf you know, perfuses the blood. So, you know, we have, you know, we're, we don't keep them on the device for the entire four time, uh, four hours. It's just the 60 minutes that we're actually, like, you know, we have to clamp the aorta so we can perform the procedure. Usually during this period, you'll see in the OR, they'll bring in buckets of ice, usually chilled with a potassium solution that causes the heart to kind of to stop beating or not beat as much. Uh, during that 60 minutes to make it easier for the surgeon to operate. It's a little bit harder to operate on a moving um, a moving and beating heart. And then, um, you know, they'll perform their, their procedure. Now, more and more, more and more facilities are doing what we're calling a beating heart surgery, where they aren't um, stopping the heart. They're not chilling it down. Um, and we're finding that the outcomes, you know, in terms of some of the cognitive outcomes might be a little bit better. And there are even some facilities now that are doing what we're calling off pump devices where they're not stopping the heart. So it's, you know, it's still, you know, it's a beating heart procedure. So the heart's not stopped. And they're also not using the bypass machine. Um, again, there are a little bit different risks for this because again, you know, if we're, you know, for the heart still pumping, it's still beating and we're not like using this external um, heart lung machine to keep the body perfused. There could be some other complications, but there are risks, especially cognitive um, issues with being on that, especially for a prolonged period of time, this, this heart lung machine. So, um, you know, again, cabbage, you know, about a four hour procedure or aorta typically clamped for about 60 minutes of it to limit the amount of blood flow to make it easier to operate. Um, classically it was done, you know, with the heart stopped and then the surgeon would restart the heart after they've, you know, restored, you know, or, or completed the, the bypass. And then, um, there are now more advanced techniques where, they don't stop the heart. They still use the heart lung machine to keep things perfused and stuff like that while the aorta is clamped. Now there, and there are even more advanced ones that don't clamp the aorta, don't use the um, heart lung bypass device, um, and they call that an off pump procedure. And again, we have a video for you guys to check out. Now, um, after the procedure is done for cabbage, the patient, uh, this is for any median sternotomy, but they'll, they'll you know, they'll wire down the sternum here using these metal wires. They'll insert uh, a uh, chest tubes to help drain because there's going to be some swelling. There's going to be some blood remaining potentially after the surgery. Um, and they'll be had that temporary pacer placed in because, again, if you operate in a heart, it's going to be irritable. And especially if it was maybe an emergent MI where there are, you know, emergent cabbage where they had an MI and the, the membrane potential is a little bit unstable. Uh, that, and that pacer usually comes out about three to four days post-operatively. Um, patients usually get out of bed the first, like the like, as soon as they get up to the ICU and you know, have restored, you know, have come, you know, come back to being conscious. Um, and we'll get into some of the rehab considerations after that. Now, the last part we'll talk about are valve replacements and repairs. So, uh, heart valves can be replaced uh, either using mechanical or biological replacement valves. So. Your mechanical valves are made out of uh, an alloy, a metal. Biological valves um, can be made out of uh, uh, human valves or cadaver harvest or pig or, or cow tissue. So you got honey boo boo here, right? The pig heart kind of thing, right? Um, and we call those xenografts. Now, the advantage of mechanical valves is that they're going to last longer. Remembering that the you know the pressures at the aorta, for example, are pretty high. Um, so for replacing maybe the aortic valve, you probably, you know, the mechanical valve might be advantageous because it's just going to last longer. It's going to hold up longer, right? Um, now, the, the 
issue with that, again, anytime we place in a metal um, you know, prosthesis or replacement, um, okay, guys, and remembering that you know, when we place in those you know, metallic devices, we risk for clots. So there's always a debate on whether or not you know, we're going to use a xenograft or a cadaver harvest, and there's even better biotechnologies that allow us to maybe use you know, uh, some sort of synthetic uh, material, uh, because again, the debate is, well, if, you know, a kid, maybe you want them to have a longer lasting valve, but if they're active, right, which kids are, like, you maybe don't want to have them um, have to be on anticoagulants or have that bleeding risk from being on an anticoagulant for the, for the rest of their lives. Now, it's an example of kind of the procedure that we see here, right? Again, they're going to open up that sternum uh, to expose the heart, you know, and then here's an example of the procedure where they'll, you know, again, they'll perform that sternotomy, expose the heart, they'll cut open the aorta, and then they'll you know, remove the disease valve and replace it with, you know, this is an example of a, of a xenograft here, um, or I think at least a biological graft where they're um, you know, placing that in, again, over you know, where that, you know, the, the former valve had been located. So this is a valve replacement and repair. Now there are other procedures, these transcatheter valve repairs and implantation. So we're repairing the valve, but we're not replacing it. Um, just like, you know, the, in the advanced, the invasive surgery, uh, there's a video of this as well. I check it out. It's kind of cool. Um, this is done for patients who are at a high risk for open heart surgery. Again, cabbage would be considered open heart surgery, even mixed really as well. Um, especially you know, because they had that prolonged, uh, bypass time or the, the heart lung machine time. Uh, so this is patients who are older, um, who might not, again, just tolerate the, the surgery. Uh, the great thing is the results, there's, there's been some stuff looking at this, um, and the outcomes are pretty comparable to what we see for an open heart surgery. Uh, so we're seeing more and more of this, and this is an example here of kind of what they do. So they send in a guide wire, just like we do with that you know, PCI or you know, our angiogram and stenting, all, that, all those procedures there. And, uh, but this will go all the way up into the aorta, and then we will, um, you know, we'll visual, you know, we'll you know, place a, a guide wire through, inflate a balloon to open up the valve, um, and implant a replacement valve. So that, you know, we'll still have that older diseased valve there. We're not cutting it out and replacing it. We're basically placing another valve, not over it, but kind of inside of it, right? So we're pushing that older valve to the side and, and leading and leading another one in its place. So this you know, is an example here for someone who maybe has aortic stenosis, um, or an aortic valve issue, maybe you know a little bit of incompetence or regurgitation. Again, we're you know, we're you know, sending that guide wire up and then implanting that um, the, the 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 replacement valve or the or the implanted valve over really the, um, or inside the, the current valve. So we're not cutting it out like we are in a repair and replacement. We are implanting, you know, our, our valve here. Um, and again, the outcomes for this are increasingly uh, positive because, you know, the technology is getting better and better. So uh, that is interventional cardiology or sorry, uh, and, and cardiac surgery in a nutshell. Um, it's interesting that I, you know, I, you know, me ask like, well, why did you include this? Like, that's not really a surgery. Well, that, that's kind of up for debate uh, in terms of who's allowed to perform these transcatheter procedures. Um, we're seeing a lot more cardiologists starting to do this kind of stuff, and it's a little bit of a turf battle with cardiac surgeons. So uh, I'll let you uh, learn more about that turf battle when you guys go in your clinical sites. But uh, that was interventional cardiology and cardiac surgery. And uh, next, we'll get into the PT implications.